Mike Flanagan is back with Leah Fong. This time with another adaptation, his most modern of all the adaptations, but you're still going all the way back to the golden age of 1994, which is why I'm wearing the Nirvana shirt, because he decided to tackle the teen classic, The Midnight Club by Christopher Pike. Honestly, when I heard this was happening, my brain kept going to the Midnight Society, which is the name of the group of the kids in Are You Afraid of the Dark? Um, which is also about a group of kids telling scary stories around a fire. So uh, it's pretty much the same, except they're not terminally ill because that is the general premise of what we're working with in The Midnight Club. A group of teens with terminal illnesses living in a hospice who sneak out of their rooms at night to tell stories around a roaring fire at midnight, giving glimpses into their souls, their lives, and how they're processing their upcoming deaths and what some of their bigger regrets might be. And it somehow gets more emotional than even that premise would suggest. The story was inspired by a young girl in a cancer ward reaching out to Pike and telling him about her real life midnight club that would read his stories and ask if he could write about them. Sadly, as fast as he got to work on the story, she still ended up passing away before it could be completed, which is just another layer of tragedy to this story. But the show takes that concept and then just massively expands it. And that expansion is for a couple simple reasons for once to kind of make it a little bit scarier. And the big one, turning it into multiple seasons, which I'm not immediately opposed to. This will be the first time that Flanagan actually takes that approach. Usually all of his shows are like one and done's or just kind of like loosely related in some way. Now, in terms of the changes from the book, other than some of the big ones we'll get into, uh, one of the central things they do to make things a little bit scarier is to change the stories that are being told at that midnight club. It also let Flanagan pull from Pike's body of work, as you'll notice from the episode titles. All the stories are some variation of Pike's novels. If they're not flat out horror, they tend to have a lot of tension, some thriller aspects, a lot of foreboding, characters making mistakes or tragedies. Not entirely, but for the most part. Honestly, the only story that stays mostly the same between the two is the two Danas, which we'll kind of touch on later. They also add three more members to the club so that it's basically every kid in the hospice, whereas in the book, it's just like a select group of the kids in the hospice. But the biggest departures we get here is one, a cult, some potential ghosts, and an alleged miracle because it's Mike Flanagan. And because it's Mike Flanagan, we're getting a nice little blend of the scares and the brutal emotions and leaves us with some fun mysteries to think about for next season. And in terms of the scares, I know there's been reports about how this has won some kind of award for having the most jump scares in a single episode of television. But when you watch it, you realize it's kind of more making fun of horror that completely relies on jump scares to get reactions out of audiences. But a lot of the tension from the atmosphere is very effective. We get the chilling whispers, the rumors of the old cults, the shadows reaching out from the darkness, to the point that you might even be able to hear some of those whispers after you stop watching. Which is why you need today's sponsor, Raycon, to drown those ghosts out. Raycon's everyday earbuds are my go-to for listening to music and audiobooks while running errands, getting in some physical activity, or just doing things around the house. The optimized gel tips keep them firmly in place and more comfortable than ever. One of my favorite features is being able to jump through three different sound profiles simply by holding down the left earbud for three seconds. I use Pure for audiobooks, Balance for most music and movies, and then that sweet bass for when I really need the deep beats in my soul. With eight hours of playtime, a 32 hour battery life, and a compact fit in a variety of colors, Raycon are guaranteed to have the perfect pair for you. And as they would like me to remind you, start at about half the price of other premium audio brands. So if you wanna find out why Raycon have so many five star reviews, make sure to head on over to buyraycon.com slash Jedi to save 15% off your order or click the link in the description below. So let's jump into the show and how it built itself out. Like the book, the show takes place in 1994. Pre smartphone, internet just starting to be a thing, chat rooms in their infancy. If anything, the show overuses computers, but that's fine. Our central character is Ilanka, a young girl diagnosed with thyroid cancer and quickly escalates to a terminal diagnosis, which would be tragic for anyone at that age, but particularly Ilanka. She was graduating early, supposed to be attending Stanford for university, a triumph after losing her mother at such a young age. So as anyone in her position might do, she found herself looking up ways to survive. Which is when she comes across the story of a medical mystery, a girl with the same cancer as her who went to a hospice called Brightcliff and miraculously healed. So she decides she needs to go to Brightcliff, obviously doesn't tell her adoptive dad that she's going in search of a miracle cure, just plays it off as wanting to pass 
class on her own terms. But when she arrives, she sees a boy listening to music, someone she's positive she's met before, someone that we saw her envision when she realized she was sick. And he's positive he's met her too, except they went to school in different states. Fans of the book will know what this means, but the show hasn't fully gone down that route, so I'm interested to see how they end up addressing it. But the second Ilanka walks into the hospice, this converted mansion, she sees a witchy looking old woman with black around her eyes and cataracts, similar to the old man she saw back at the party when she first realizes she's sick. And that's where the layers really start piling in. She'll regularly have dreams and hallucinations of this woman, see this man in mirrors, and on top of that, there's multiple accounts of patients mentioning shadows reaching out at them as they're approaching death. The girl who used to have Alonka's bed even turned to witchcraft to try and protect herself from these shadows. But as mentioned, Brightcliff has a little bit of a dark history. After being built by an oil baron in 1901, it housed a cult called the Paragon in the 40s before Dr. Stanton ended up buying it. Cult drama, cult drama, cult drama, but not yet. One of the other major changes from the book is that our kindly Dr. White has been changed to our Dr. Stanton, similar in their missions and histories of losing a child, but different in execution. In terms of the other staff, we have nurse practitioner Mark, who we know is cool because they gave him Jordans to wear with his scrubs. Though because I get unusually into sneaker tube like twice a year, I was fairly certain that these shoes didn't exist in 1994 in this colorway, and I seem to be correct. They appear to be a Jordan 1 mini Chicago black toe from 2020. So explain, Mr. Flanagan. My immersion is completely lost. I'm joking. It obviously doesn't matter at all. And as much as I say I'm into this, I still just end up wearing the same checkered bands all the time. There's also this kind old janitor who just leaves them with these wise sayings following a death, like not being able to take anything with you when you die, which is also what's so important about these stories that they're telling to each other. That's what they get to leave behind. But then in terms of our Midnight Club members, there's obviously Alanka, our lead. On top of being at Bright Cliff to find a cure for her illness, she's also obsessed with different types of herbs and teas to try to kick herself into remission. The main point here being that she hasn't fully accepted her death. She's not here to pass on peacefully. She even still keeps up with her college syllabus because she assumes she'll be going to school soon. Kevin, the former all-star runner, pride of his family, trying so hard to stay perfect so he can leave them with nothing but positive positive memories. He and Alonka start forming a very strong bond of this like perceived familiarity, but he has a girlfriend that he neglects to mention. And your sister is way prettier. Oh man, I'm, I'm so stupid. Yikes. Anya is Alonka's roommate. She can be bitter and come across as cruel, but she's absolutely a fierce friend. Spencer is a young gay man who has contracted AIDS in the book. He wanted to keep it concealed because of the stigma that existed for teens in the 90s, and that definitely still applies today in a lot of areas. The show bypasses that entirely. He's very open about his sexuality, and the show uses that to make sure it can dispel some misconceptions about AIDS. Now, the added dynamic to his story is that his mom has essentially been refusing to speak to him since he came out because of her religious beliefs. In the book, his specific guilt is linked to the fact that he believes he's the one who got his boyfriend sick and why he died. And the show ends up reversing this. Instead of feeling guilt of something he might have done, he feels forgiveness for the person who gave it to him. And lastly, from the original book crew is Sandra, the religious one of the group. In the book, she's the only one who never tells a story, which is important, but we'll get to that. Apparently, all she does uh, here is tell uh, angel porn as they like to talk about it. And I feel like what they would have described as angel porn in 1994 is very different than in the landscape of 2022 fan fiction. But moving on, the show ends up adding in new characters like Amesh, who's beat the odds of survival so far, but hasn't been able to see his parents because of immigration issues. He's the gamer of the group. Natsuki ends up losing her roommate early in the show and she's kind of been bouncing her story off of her before she dies. And it ends up being this super interesting heartbreak breaking one about her suicide attempt before she was even diagnosed. It's a variation on the story Road to Nowhere, how she passed out in the car in the garage, but then in her mind actually left and ends up picking up two hitchhikers, one of which is desperately trying to get her to stop and shut off the car, and the other one wants her to keep it running. It's really beautiful and haunting and kind of goes how easy it would be just to let go, but that life is worth making the choice to live. But then the flip side of that ends up being that she gets to the hospital and finds out she has has cancer and is dying anyway. And Sherry, a pathological liar whose family is involved in the entertainment and film industry, but as much as she lies, she has a heart 
of gold. She's constantly going out of her way to do things for the people around her just because she can, like getting Alonka a proper wig made and making sure that Amesh gets a chance to play a PlayStation 1 before he dies. Now in the show, she's the one who never tells a story. And I feel like it's because she tells so many stories on a daily basis that it just kind of that there's no reason for her to do it at the club. Which brings us to the Midnight Club itself. And even though they can tell any type of story they want, more often than not, they end up being scary or ghost stories. They essentially make new ghosts because that's all they really are. But it ends up being a lot deeper than that. The more it seems like they're approaching death, the more the stories seem to be leaving pieces of themselves behind. Which kind of leads into the other part of the pact. Whoever dies first has to reach out and send a sign to prove the afterlife to the people left behind. Another big change from the book is that they had started the group amongst themselves, but in the show, this is something that's been passed on from generation to generation. Every time a new patient gets brought in, they find out about the club and it continues on. But to be accepted, Alonka has to tell a story. And she tells the one about Julia Jane, the miracle survivor of Brightcliff, how she went missing in the middle of the night, then returned a week later, completely healed. And everyone assumes this is just a story, except Kevin, who's actually taken the time to read the names of the past patients on the bright cliff walls. So he knows that at least some of what she's saying is true and then she lets him know that that's why she's here. I hope I didn't sound like I was chasing something stupid. Then the first episode ends with a kind of out of character flagpole sitta, which just makes me feel like Netflix got the rights to that song and will just use it anywhere. It remotely feels relevant because they, they just had it in Due Revenge. Uh, even though the song was only released in 1997, uh, that will be a trend. So in Alonka's first one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Stanton, she asks about Julia and the Paragon cult, and both topics seem to make her nervous. She claims not to remember Julia at first, which is very odd because you'd think that if someone ended up miraculously cured from a terminal illness in your hospice after disappearing for a week, uh, she might be a little bit memorable. Keep in mind that she is the creator and owner of this hospice, not just a new employee, and flat out denies knowing anything about the cult, which was apparently well-documented enough that Alonka could find information about it on the 1994 World Wide Web. So clearly all of this is a lie and these topics are very much bothering her. So when Alonka ends up side collecting river water that apparently has healing properties and this chick rocks up, I for one assumed it was Julia based on how passive aggressive she seemed to be about Stanton and two, I don't trust her because she was this chick a year ago. This chick and any kind of cult do not mix. I'm sorry Flanagan, I'm on to you. Alonka will continue to run into this girl who goes by Shasta throughout the series. She finds out that she runs this holistic company that she likes called Good Humor, which is a play on the four Greek humors, which they believed linked to like all ailments a person could have and says that the Paragon was also dedicated to healing, they just went about things a little too extreme. You know, as cults do. So my alarm bells, spidey senses if you may call them, are just the tingling. But as she's leaving the forest that first time, she sees this double triangle hourglass symbol carved into the tree, which is also a symbol they lingered on a couple times in the elevator in the first episode. Yeah, don't worry, I noticed that shit. And she'll notice the symbol again after stealing Julia's patient files from Stanton, because of course she was gonna do that. Julia seems to have drawn that same same tree with the symbol and has the numbers 292.13 scribed all over her art. The number itself is going to stay a mystery for a little bit, but she eventually realizes that the symbol is in the elevator. Figures out that it's a secret button and takes her and Kevin down to some kind of sub-basement, which very obviously was used for cult stuff. There's murals painted, a beautiful ceiling, the hourglass on the floor, beds. But it also seems to be the original meeting place of the Midnight Club. They find a journal from the original members that kept the minutes of the meeting, some of the stories, and who wrote that journal and founded the club? Julie Julia Jane, the miracle survivor, because everything's connected. You may also notice that all the story titles are Christopher Pike novels. And every time Alonka seems to learn something new about the cult, she has these weird flashback memories, including this cultish looking group walking towards the elevator, presumably headed down to do cult shit. But the rest of the club is pretty disturbed by the place, uh, particularly Sandra. They find a ceremonial dagger, old robes, and it all really goes into high gear when they hit a journal page that turns 
up covered with bloody art. So, you know, some good old blood rituals going on here. Alonka obviously isn't swayed and all this immediately results in is Sandra trying to push the group towards God and away from the darkness, which Spence clearly has an issue with because God has been used as a weapon against who he is as a person. But after a little tip from Shasta about looking up different types of holistic health in the hospice library, Alonka realizes that 292.13 is probably a Dewey Decimal Code and finds the Paragon Leader's Daughter's Journal. So fun that Shasta just happened to be super knowledgeable about like the coding system of the Dewey Decimal System, which I imagine the person who hid the journal there would also have to be aware of. Hmm. But the journal reveals that the founder of the Paragon essentially became obsessed with Greek culture for alternative healing, specifically the five sisters, Asiso, Panacea, Hygieia, Iaso, and Aglaia. Regina, the founder, took on the role of Asiso and then designated four sisters and eventually escalated to blood sacrifice to achieve her healing. But I guess she just didn't feel like this was working or like the right kind of offering for the Greek god, so she decided to escalate to human sacrifice, aka poisoning the sisters. And I don't even think she was sick. I think she just wanted to live longer. Thankfully, her daughter alerted the cops and the cult was shut down. I guess her excuse of, oh my God, I don't know what happened. I thought it was just tea work though. So she's just, out there somewhere. So Alonka realizes that some version of this ritual must have been used to save Julia Jane. And instead of being turned off by, you know, the murder requirements, Alonka just tries to convince everyone to take part. And wouldn't you know it, Shasta seems to know exactly what to do. Which is when Alonka notices that she has the hourglass tattooed on her wrist. And instead of immediately just shutting her down and being like, oh shit, you actually believe what the Paragon says, she believes the explanation that, oh, she just agrees with like the general core ideas of their healing, just not their method of going about it. You can do it just by sacrificing important items. First to save Anya, who's taken a turn for the worse, but ultimately so they can just keep repeating it to save them all. Again, most of them are very against this, particularly Sandra. I think that kind of goes against everything she believes and she does still try to stop them in the end, but ends up agreeing to take part. And yes, they literally conduct a blood ritual, which ends not in a miracle, but with those shadows we've talked about reaching out and swarming down at Anya, which has been happening for a couple days now. She was constantly seeing shadows lurking, things sweeping at her in the dark, passing out from these perceived attacks. Alanka even saw that old woman lingering above her bed, seemingly a death omen that we will get to. But even though Alanka can see this woman, every time she tries to follow her, her reality gets shifted. As if she's being sent back in time, and on so many of these occasions, the person she follows ends up shifting into Kevin, which we will also get to. At one point later, it's revealed that he's been like sleepwalking and always ends back up in that sub-basement and even starts sleeping in some of the beds. But before the ritual, Anya tells her real story to Alanka. How she started rebelling after her parents moved to America to give her a chance at a dance scholarship. She started partying sneaking out of the house. And the one time her parents noticed and went looking for her, they got in a car accident and died. How she got hooked on drugs and pushed her best friend away for trying to help her, which is very similar to the story she told in the Midnight Club, the two Danas. A story of the devil offering to duplicate her, one to be perfect and one to have fun. Both halves would feel everything and she'd never have to disappoint the people around her. But of course, this isn't sustainable. You can't maintain two distinct lives when you're sharing everything inside. And again, it ultimately resulted in her pushing away the people that she loved and becoming a shell of the person she used to be. And it makes a special note to point out that like in the story, Anya had this ballerina figure that her friend Rhett gave her that she ends up throwing at him the last time he tried to help her, which breaks one of its legs and ends up being the same leg she loses in real life. So she thinks that the cancer and losing her legs is some kind of retribution against the mistakes she made, against the rebelling, against hurting the people she loves, which obviously isn't true, but she's eternalized. It. I don't want to tell you that. <laughs> Which brings us to probably the most emotional episode of the show. At first, it seems like the ritual did work and that Anya went into some spontaneous remission, but it wasn't a happy reality. She was still hooked on drugs, ended up in a series of programs, rehabs, and feels a ton of guilt from being the sole survivor because the ritual never worked again. But things start to feel a little surreal. She starts to run into all the characters from the stories the other club members told, seemingly horrified before she wakes up back in her bed to the sound of the Midnight Club coming through her radio. Which is when we realize that everything that just happened is likely the result of Anya being in a coma. 
and her brain just processing her guilt and her regrets and the unfinished business of never reconnecting with Rhett. How she knows she messed up, but she still feels angry that he's never reached out. Which is when we realize that the voices coming through the radio is the Midnight Club on the other side of the door telling her stories through the intercom as she's in the process of dying. Every time she was shutting off the radio was her tuning out the Midnight Club outside. But the story they tell is a kind one. It's about how she survived and came back to perform the ritual until every single one of them was healed. How they all live together until she eventually reconnects with that childhood best friend. They get married and have kids and the whole club moves to the same block as they grow old together, healthy and happy. But that's not what happened. She passed out after the ritual. Stanton came down and lost her mind at them and Alanka realizes that she went too far. But it's those final moments of Alanka talking to her, saying that everything's gonna be okay, that lets Anya let go and pass on. They go on to properly honor her down by the beach, spread spreading her ashes and singing Good Riddance by Green Day, which wasn't out yet, but I guess that's fine. I'll be honest, I know that was supposed to be particularly emotional, and I always said that that is actually the song I would want played at my funeral, but uh, there's something about a series of off-key teens singing a song that I, I just, I couldn't. That's like the third overt 1997 reference. I don't know if that means anything, but we have to get the fallout. Stanton is obviously shocked and horrified at what's happened, which, fair, they were performing blood rituals in the basement, rubbing blood on someone who's immunocompromised. And she reveals what was always obvious, that she and the staff are fully aware that they sneak out every night to tell stories and they've allowed it to happen so she can just as easily take it away. Why do you think there's always fresh fire? So on top of her frustration with Stanton, Ilanka's heartbroken over losing Anya and what she saw as her last chance of survival. So not only is she processing that death, but her impending death as well. All of us here were already gone. Which is when Shasta catches up with her again, says that it's possible that the ritual did work, just not for Anya. So she explains what the symbol means, that the hourglass is made up of the Greek signs for air and earth as above, so below, that you could always turn the hourglass over before it runs out, that life will prevail. That is what the Paragon was trying to do. They just, they got lost along the way. But to me that just screams, we can keep performing rituals and sacrificing multiple lives to steal more time. Now at this point, it should be obvious if it wasn't already that Shasta is Julia. We've got a woman whose age checks out for when Julia would have been a Brightcliff, who knows a lot about Brightcliff and has an apparent feud going on with Stanton, is obsessed with Greek names and their healing rituals, knows all about this Greek-based cult, named her company after the Greek humors and has a tattoo of the cult symbol. Even if it wasn't obvious that this is Julia, there's enough here to suggest, hey, maybe we should stay away from this person. But obviously she won't, Ilanka needs to believe. And that belief only gets stronger when she overhears Stanton talking on the phone about how someone might have been misdiagnosed as terminal. So obviously Ilanka believes that it's her, something that Shasta only encourages, even mentions that if things get too hard with Stanton, she can move in with her group. Girl, run. Smart teenagers are the worst because they never realize how stupid they actually are. So now she's obviously trying to convince the group that it worked, that she's the one who's healed and they need to immediately keep going with the rituals until Sandra drops the bomb that it's her and that it had nothing to do with the ritual, that her tests to confirm the misdiagnosis were performed before the ritual and that she's still sick, just not terminal. Now I'm gonna slide in here with some book info that this is specifically the reason why Sandra never told a story because she wasn't ever one of those terminal kids. It's just something that adds to the symbolism. I can understand the show wanting to go against that and being like, no, she's part of the club. She's one of us. It doesn't matter what her diagnosis is, but I, I get what the original intention of the book is and I enjoy it. So this is pretty much the last straw for Alanka. She goes to storm out before being intercepted by Catherine, Kevin's girlfriend. Now I've danced around a lot, but Alanka really likes Kevin and Kevin seems like he likes her too. The two seem to have this like deeper connection, but again, Girlfriend, a girl who seems a little bit delusional as to what hospice uh, actually means. And it just really ties back into the idea that Kevin is trying to be perfect for everyone so they don't have a bad memory of him. He can't tell his mom that he can't run anymore because she still thinks he's gonna be a track star and he can't break up with his girlfriend because like you don't wanna make her sad before you die and make her sad. Now at this point, Alonka doesn't have full insight into this and just has her own desires and regrets that she's looking to avoid happening and snaps when 
Catherine just won't leave her alone when she's clearly crying and asking to be left alone. So she loses it, calls her delusional, which Kevin walks in on, so she runs out and finds Shasta, who finally reveals what's been obvious, she's Julia. And she wants Alonka to help her get into the school so they can try and conduct another ritual to save her. But based on Julia's desperation and how much she wanted that journal, I'm guessing that she's sick again and this is her desperate plea to heal herself. Apparently all those years ago, she left to track down Regina, the old cult leader, and begged for her teaching. Presumably conducted a ritual somehow, we don't know what they did for sacrifices there, but then wandered back through the woods in her PJ so she could just pretend it was truly a miracle that she didn't remember. Now, obviously, Alanka isn't thinking about potential devious plans. She is desperate to literally survive. So after the Midnight Club ends, she lets Julia in, followed by three sisters for the ritual. And pretty quickly, it all goes to shit. First off, they are clearly setting up Julia to be the one healed, not Alanka. It becomes very obvious that she plans to poison them all and Alanka almost falls for it until Stanton comes in and the sisters start puking up a storm from poisoning. So yeah, you might have messed up in life, but I bet you haven't messed up to the tune of accidentally orchestrating a death cult in your basement. Or maybe you have, I don't know your life. So by the end, it seems like Julia didn't have a miracle at all. She beat it, she got better. There's something here. There isn't. She's no different than Sandra. She was just lucky and actually had a misdiagnosis, but now she's just so desperate to try and recreate that same miracle that she thought she experienced all those years ago. However, it's pretty clear that something more is happening, whether it is actually some kind of like magic healing from the cult offerings or some completely unrelated ghosty activity. But Julia manages to escape because Stanton is distracted trying to save the disciples. So now we're winding into our conclusion. The shadows seem to be coming for a mesh next, which which seems like a good enough time to explain what might be happening there. During one of the last meetings of the Midnight Club, they start talking about the shadows Anya said Rachel saw before her death and how she was seeing them too. And Alonka and Kevin mention the old lady and the old man, which is when Natsuki starts talking about a story that her mother told her about Toshino Taburuhito, or Eater of Years. That doesn't seem to be something that actually exists unless it translates out to something different, but it's kind of like a death note type thing. It's apparently an entity that takes the form of an old lady that hangs around where people are dying so it can eat the years they would have had left. So a hospice for teenagers would be pretty ideal, like a buffet. And while I don't think that fully explains what's happening with the old man and lady, it, it definitely seems like part of it. One of the times that Alonka gets jump scared by the old lady, she just talks about how hungry she is. And at one point she's like looming over Anya's almost dying body. Sweetheart, I'm hungry. But then there's the other side. Almost every time Alonka ends up following this woman, she morphs back into Kevin. And when she sees the old man, it's in the mirror. And that started before she even made it to Brightcliff. And Kevin says that he sees the old man more. And I would guess that he sees the old woman when he's looking in a mirror. So I think there's some kind of generational wave here where in a past life, Kevin was that woman and Alonka was that man. That might seem weird, but in the book, all of Alonka's stories have to do with her remembering some past life. And in each of those past lives, Kevin is there either as a lover or a dear friend, either a man or a woman, but always someone super important to her life. And it all seems to go back to this moment where they agreed to share the other's sin. So in every life, they'll find each other and no love, but it'll never be peaceful. It'll always be doomed to some kind of misfortune or tragedy. Point being, they've met in a hospice while dying. See what I mean about this whole story just being one big giant gut stab? Though we'll say the book ends with them years years later with the earth being destroyed as they're kind of like flying off in a ship together. So it seems hopeful. Oh, to add more to the brutality of the book, I forgot to mention that Anya doesn't just kind of like pass of her own accord. She's in such extreme pain that she asks Spence to smother her to give her back dignity in her death which he sees as a chance to give back the dignity he feels he took from potentially getting his boyfriend sick. Brutal. I will touch more on my thoughts and theories about the old couple at the end, but speaking of Anya, her childhood friend Rhett shows up because he saw the obituary. Alonka lets him know how much she thought about him till the very end, how she regrets her actions and how sorry she was, which is when he realizes that the statue she threw at him is repaired and assumes she had it fixed. You know, the statue that we were specifically shown was broken Broken. It's perfectly repaired as if nothing had ever happened to it. And that seems to be the sign that Anya sent from the afterlife. She always said,
said that if she could, she'd make sure it was something they couldn't ignore, that they could hold. Seems like she did. A freaking heart, man. Oh my gosh. But continuing on, Kevin finally lets Catherine go, letting her know that it's really just inevitable and not really fair to either of them. And he finishes his story. He's been telling the story in pieces because he always wanted to leave people something to think about. But it's been the story of a serial killer who is compelled to kill at the instruction of his mother from some passed down serial killer spirit. Based on Pike's novel, The Wicked Heart, and instead of living out alone like Dusty, Kevin tells Alonka how he feels. I'm going to die. Me too. But I've been thinking that dying is a really shitty reason not to live. Which winds us into our final Midnight Club story, The End of Alonka's, which is based on Pike's novel, Witch. Hers was particularly interesting because it involves a character making essentially all the same types of mistakes she's been, but like not learning from them. Her character is Imani, who has some healing powers and can see the future. But if you try to stop something from happening, the universe would try to correct it. So Imani ends up breaking the one rule of scrying and uses the power after dark and sees a boy die in a shooting. And when that situation seems to be playing out in front of her, she stops it from happening. Which just results in one of her friends taking his place, ending up in a coma, but then not long after, he still ends up shot. So she realizes that the only way to set the timeline right is to sacrifice herself to save the friend who swapped into the timeline. So she has one last final conversation with her friend as she gives her the ability to heal. And all she wants is to be remembered. Which is all any of these kids want, so Alonka can't get herself to finish, so Cherie takes over. Her first time telling or contributing to a story and everyone takes a turn. Her friend Scotty wakes up desperately trying to hold on to what happened but ultimately can't, but that doesn't mean that any of them forget about Imani. One trinket, one memory, one gesture, one laugh, one tear at a time. So Alonka has the strength to finish the story and this is ultimately her accepting death. That her desperation caused real damage, that you can't fight fate, but knowing that no matter whatever happens, she'll live on. And that concludes the meetings of the Midnight Club, but certainly not the end of the planned story. It cuts to Stanton, who walks by a picture of the original home builders, who looks surprisingly like the man and woman Alonka and Kevin have seen, which would explain why the location immediately seems so familiar to Alonka. And I also have to believe that they're likely the ones who started the cult. I imagine that they had to be the ones that built the sub basement and the sub basement is accessed through the button which is the cult symbol. But then we get our big reveal. Stanton pulls off her wig and has the symbol tattooed on her neck. So it's pretty safe to assume that Stanton is Athena, the daughter of the cult leader, the one who wrote the journal because she has the same tattoo. Which would explain why she was so clearly bothered about Alonka asking questions and how she immediately knew what had been going on with the rituals. And like her mom, some things happened to make her lose all her hair. I don't know if she's sick or if it's just some kind of byproduct of what's happening. So I kind of think in a moment of desperation, she tried to save her son, Julian. So how might that tie into the ghost drama? If the original house builders are truly lingering in the halls, eating the years these kids are losing, is it something Stanton's doing specifically to appease them? Instead of cult sacrifices, is she just running this hospice because she knows it'll be guaranteed deaths? As mentioned, the old lady clearly seems to be trying to eat something and it could just be that Alonka is the only one who can see her as the old woman and everyone else just sees her as this looming shadow. So it kind of seems like something's happened to trap these two in the house, eating those years which extends their life as whatever they are in between life and death. I don't necessarily want to believe that Stanton is evil or doing anything evil intentionally, but again, if she had her own sick, dying child, I can only imagine what levels of desperation she would have gone to. Time will tell. If we go with the concept of reincarnation, uh, whatever's happening with a couple in the house seems to have pieces of them stuck away from that process of reincarnation, even though it seems like Alonka and Kevin seem to have connections to them in that past life, so that's kind of getting a little bit messy. The old lady also seems seems to call Alonka sweetheart, which would track with her thinking that she's her husband. So I feel like they as a couple must have started some of this unholiness. So there are a ton of angles we can go. There's a bunch that I thought of that I ended up discarding because they just get messier than what this kind of already has. But I'm sure that Flanagan will knock it out of the park when we eventually get there. And I'm sure it's also going to be super tragic because all of these kids are knocking on death's door. But that's going to do it. Let me know what you guys are thinking down below. I know I skimmed over a lot specifically 
specifically a lot of the details and the individual stories that a lot of the characters told. Some of them are really good. If you haven't checked out the show yet and you're a fan of Flanagan's previous work, I would recommend checking it out. It is certainly not my favorite. I think that Hill House and Bly Manor are just like leaps and bounds above like everything he's done, but this was still very good. It's definitely uh, more of kind of like the YA, the young adult approach to a horror show, but it's good and it's done well. And I'm always talking about how this kind of stuff needs to be done better. So let me know what you guys are thinking down below. So thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members with a special thank you to my latest Jedi Master level supporter, John M. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. You can follow all my different social medias that I have linked down below. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later.